How are you dealing with uh, in being in the pandemic? Are you doing uh, shows over Facebook Live, uh, doing live performing just from wherever you're at? Well, I've been uh, very fortunate that uh, I've had a chance to do a couple of drive-in shows, a few walk-in shows, and then a lot of it has been pre-recorded uh, uh, shows for um, workshops, festivals, as well as uh, performances at venues that um, you know I would have normally played at. Yeah, do you, how do you, do you miss the the? I mean, everybody obviously misses yeah. uh, the live performing and going on tour and all of that. That's just uh, been a big adjustment for everybody. Yeah, it really has. Uh, I mean, it it's definitely. Um, yeah, it's definitely a change of pace for sure. You know, for the past uh, 15 years, uh, that's what I've done for my living since 2005. And and so in one way, it's just a, a complete shift from everything I've ever known. You know, even uh, planning out 14 months in advance is usually my uh, standard business practice. And I mean, for me, it's just been amazing to uh, just uh, change it into a much uh, <laughs> a much more day-to-day type of planning. So that's been one part of it. Uh, of course, uh, seeing a lot of the venues that I would usually play at start to um, close or be in distress. That's been very distressful. Friends of mine to learn that they've had, had troubles uh, either touring um, financially or or even, of course, we're talking about a pandemic. Some people are getting sick, and I've had quite a few friends that have uh, told me that they've gotten sick and recovered, and you know, thankfully, minor cases in some. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of everything. <laughs> I know, seriously. Have you been doing a lot of writing and recording these last eight months, being all sheltered in? Well, you know, funny enough, I'm always writing, recording, um, putting together projects, researching. So I do that 24-7 anyway. Uh, so this has allowed me to uh, really pull together some of the elements that I've uh, placed on some of the projects. Some of them are really big ideas. I kind of like, um, you know, Black Cowboys took me about um, 10 years of uh, forensic research and then two years of actually writing to get the final product together. So it was, uh, you know, and again, I wasn't actively researching the whole time, but I was picking up different materials that when I decided to put into a project, I, I was able to uh, uh, draw upon uh, quite a, a variety of materials that I had found all over the country and the world. And so that w- that's how I usually work anyway. So in one way, it's it's been helpful just because I'm not running around on tour trying to do the projects and tour at the same time. So in one way, it's been helpful for trying to just sit down and write Um, Because it's just different than my usual process, which is doing it all at once. And then, of course, I have my family on the road with me, my wife and my uh, two and a half year old daughter. Uh And uh, so that it's it's a lot of uh, moving parts all the time. So um, and that's uh, something uh, that's, uh, you know, we've committed to that in general. So uh, in one way, we're still trying to move forward as best as we can and maneuver like everyone else, taking the procedures and and trying our best to be uh, uh, mindful. Yeah, it sounds like you're just like, you're a really good multitasker. If you could do projects and tour, that's that's quite a feat uh, as an artist. Well, you know, I always tell people that I had a very fortunate experience where um, I guess at one point, what I would have uh, considered a bunch of uh, useless information, it became useful information, and I found a, a, a type of work that allowed me to express that. Of course, I have a, uh, a BA in English, so I have a, a standard American literature degree, and so uh, uh, incorporating that into folk music was uh, something that was always of interest to me. And so in 2005, when I went to the Black Banjo Gathering and saw that there was a way to expand the idea of African American, Caribbean, and African banjo styles, and and also showing the different ways that those pathways of folk music uh, fit within blues and jazz and country music, that was something that really just intrigued me. And the chance to, to spend time with Joe Thompson as well as John D. Holman and a whole bunch of other wonderful blues singers. I just uh, packed up everything from my uh, hometown of Phoenix and went right to North Carolina. That's where I started. I ended up in New York City for a while and uh, North Carolina again and Washington, D.C. And then now I'm hanging out in Chicago. 
Oh, that is awesome. Such rich in music too. Uh, but Phoenix of all places, you, you were raised there. We don't think of Phoenix as being the, the musical Mecca that's uh, like you know, Chicago or New York, Washington. Yeah, well, you know, Phoenix is really an interesting place because I found over time that there, there, uh, Phoenix was always a stop-off point halfway between uh, Los Angeles and uh, Las Vegas and Denver, Colorado, just like it is now, you know, Route 66. And even uh, connecting to Bakersfield, it was a place where people like Buck Owens and Waylon Jennings would stop off. And it was really a very interesting scene. But when I was growing up, none of that was there. It was, a, it was a very scattered and there was a lot of punk and alternative scenes, um, hit a lot of hip hop, underground hip hop. Um, uh, gosh, um, there was a, a, some folk clubs um, and also there were poetry clubs and I used to perform a, a poetry, a spoken word, a beat poetry, and then slam poetry later on. And, and so I just uh, performed a variety of different styles and I did that for about seven, eight years. And then that's when I went to the gathering, it was about uh, eight, seven or eight years of doing folk music of different types. So going back, growing up in Phoenix, were your parents a heavy influence on you uh, mixing academics and music and going up from there? Well, my parents were advocates for education in a general sense. Uh, what I did with the education was really up to me, and they really uh, held to that. They just, they said they wanted, you know, my father was uh, very, um, uh, he was very strict about uh, have. Uh, that I had to graduate college because as long as I had a degree, at least I could show that I, I went through the whole process of uh, higher education, which was very good for me because after I did five years in um, college at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, I, you know, when I, between going to my classes, it, uh, reading Mark Twain and Shakespeare and Chaucer and Wordsworth and uh, all those different uh, essential pieces of early literature. Um, I uh, was also moonlighting in the LP collection at the library and I and they had a, a beautiful complete collection of the Folkways catalog as well as a lot of early Arhuli records and a Library of Congress field recordings and so I would just go Dewey Decimal System and write I wrote and get this is in 2000 2001 so this is far before the internet had caught up to you know where you could do forensic research outside of Dewey Decimal and then basic uh, uh, word processing computers, you know. So I had to write down uh, 24 different, uh, I don't know, little uh, uh, note cards of records. And, and I just listened to all these different records and made my own homemade bootleg CDs of them. So I carried those with me as I went out in 2005. So I'd studied a lot of different types of folk music. And, um, and then as I went out there, I found that there were new places that hadn't been uh, discovered or or reanalyzed even. And so I took that uh, with me everywhere I went. Nowadays, the Dewey Decimal System is something that uh, kids have never even known about or even seen, and 78 vinyl records, much yeah. less even the 33 and a third. I mean, okay. it must be like a <laughs> total shock, but you were into that. Oh yeah, well, you know, it was an interesting uh, sort of thing where around 1998, 1999, I got interested in just listening to vinyl records. First, I got a, a copy of, um, I think it was a, it was a copy of, what was it? It was a Jim Croce's Greatest Love Songs. And I just saw it at a, at a little, uh, uh, I don't know, a little uh, a flea market for a dollar or something like that. A really great cover. And he has this awesome hat on it and everything and the, the cigar. And I didn't know what it, the music was. And, and uh, my parents at the time, uh, they had a record player, but it was broken. And what I ended up doing was I, I bought a turntable, but I didn't realize you needed a receiver or anything like that. Cause at that time, of course, there wasn't a lot of information out about turntables for just anybody right. to find out and let alone getting a needle, any of those things that really wasn't, you could go to radio shack, but it was still before the big revolution of vinyl had come back in. So um, I was just searching around and I made my own bootleg, um, uh, audio systems that I would play records off of and I had my own little uh, way I could digitize the records through a four track recorder and I used to make my own homemade albums and I did that for many years and so that was something I did before I left North Carolina so when I went to North Carolina I was trying to document the new folk revival that was coming up 
uh, around 2005, 2006 going on. And there were just a couple, a lot of different movements that were happening up all the way into 2020. It's been um, phenomenal to see how many uh, uh, varieties of uh, styles of music that are of folk root, folk origin, or folk derived have, uh, have sprung up in the well of music, you know? <laughs> How did, how did you end up in North Carolina from going from Arizona to North Carolina? Well, North Carolina, I had heard it was a, a really great place to go. I had heard Asheville, North Carolina was a, was a great music town. And so I just was interested in North Carolina just in a general sense, but I was also a big fan of Doc Watson and Bascom Lamar Lunsford, as well as John Coltrane and Nina Simone. So I, North Carolina had a certain uh, a special quality that I wanted to visit the place. But when I went to the Black Banjo Gathering, so at that point, uh, I'd lived in North Carolina, I mean, in Arizona my whole life. And I went out to two national poetry slams, one in Chicago and one in Minnesota in 2002 and three. And those were the major trips I had made outside of Arizona. And so as I was finishing college, the gathering was in April of 2005. And then I finished in May of 2005. And so nothing was really holding me back. And I wanted to give... Um, give it a shot in music. I, I thought that um, when I met Joe Thompson and I found that the banjo had an African-American origin and a very rich history that uh, was running sideline with the mainstream history that I knew, because uh, I was also a fan of bluegrass music. I loved uh, old timey music, Flatt and Scruggs and Bill Monroe. And to find that there was an alternate um, I, I, I'd hate to say alternate because it would it would make it sound like this history was not relevant or um, happening at the same time as as uh, the history we've heard before. Um, but when I begin to hear that there were stories that ran parallel with the mainstream history, let's say it that way, that had an African American origin that connected blues and country. Um, in certain ways that I guess at the time I had seen them uh, maybe uh, I, I guess uh, they had been uh, teased at or referenced or they had been uh, suggested at one point or another. Um, I think about Hank Williams and a lot of the songs that he recorded. I, I felt like uh, songs like uh, My Bucket's Got a Hole in It, uh, when you know that Washboard Sam also recorded a version 10 years before uh, you start to see that there's a um, there's an interchange between country and blues music. And so when I started to play string band music and formed Carolina Chocolate Drops, I wanted to bring the blues, jug band, and fife and drum and country blues aspects to uh, to string band music. So being a part of the Carolina Chocolate Drops, how many years was that? And did so you was, do a lot with them too? Oh yeah, well I, I founded the group. Uh, I'm one of the original members uh, from 2005 to 2000. Thirteen, and I left in 2014. Uh, and so, uh, when I went out to North Carolina, I had I had met the original two members, and I uh, Justin Robinson and and Rian Giddens, and I I had uh, I had started to uh, go to the jams with them down at at Joe Thompson's house. So I'd met Joe Thompson at the Black Banjo Gathering, and I had also gotten a wonderful good time during banjo from the silent auction at the Black Banjo Gathering. And they gave it to me because they thought I was a very promising young banjo player. And they thought that I should learn a five string because at the time I was playing a four string plectrum banjo, which is what I still play in my shows. Uh, when I first started out, I didn't know that you needed five strings to play the banjo. And when I first wanted to learn to play, uh, the first banjo I found was a Ludwig uh, tenor banjo, which is more of a, what they call Dixieland jazz, which is a, um, a, a old time New Orleans jazz. And, and especially in the 50s, there were groups like the Firehouse Five plus two and, and different groups that um, also the Preservation Hall Jazz Band are a great uh, exponent of this style of music. And the, they had banjo players and I, I would find all these records in the junk shops. And uh, so I learned a little bit of a four string jazz banjo playing, but then I also incorporated Doc Boggs, early country blues and any other type of music that I had heard on the guitar. And uh, so I switched back and forth between the guitar and the banjo. And uh, by the time I went out to North Carolina, I began to learn about North Carolina traditional music and began to study with people out there. 
Yeah, so much artistry in the Asheville area. It's just, of all the arts in that area, it's just the mountains. There's just something about that that really brings out so much good music and then the culinary arts and the visuals. It's just, I'm sure it's awe-inspiring being in that area. Well, one of the things that was funny with North Carolina, too, I went out to Asheville and it was a nice town, but there were so many musicians. I, I just found I couldn't get a foothold. And so I, I actually uh, made my way all the way down to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and Hillsborough, North Carolina, so down in the Piedmont. And so that was something that was interesting when I first uh, started to go down was uh, I found that um, the music of people like Elizabeth Cotton had a special place in the Piedmont of North Carolina with a special type of finger picking uh, known as uh, uh, Piedmont style guitar. It's a beautiful little alternating thumb bass guitar style that mimics the sound of two guitars playing at one time. And so I was a fan of this music beforehand, but when I had a chance to go down to North Carolina, I got to meet the wonderful folks at Music Maker Relief Foundation, and I got to meet some wonderful living tradition bears, and I got to learn the old time music going to people's houses. And I got to sit with them and I got to learn their stories as well as the songs. And then, of course, with Joe Thompson, I did the same thing, but with fiddle and banjo music. And I was um, the guitar player in a group that had fiddle, banjo, guitar. And I played guitar, uh, four string banjo, quills, bones. And I learned the rhythm bones very um, soon after I got to North Carolina. And that took me back to my earliest uh, the only formal training I've actually had on music, which is playing percussion, which I played in, in grade school. And so when I started to play the rhythm bones, all of a sudden, the world of percussion opened up to me and the world of old time music, it combined into one thing for me. And so that was a beautiful meeting of um, uh, a couple of different parts of my musical journey. So anyway, that's a, <laughs> and that was just the start, you know. It sounds so ambitious. So what was it like feeling like, okay, I'm going to strike out now on my own solo after being in a group? Was that a little bit, did you have any trepidation at that point? Or, or did it just feel natural? It was like, it's time. Well, it was a little bit of both. I think first, we had covered so many of our goals within the group and we were together for nine years. And so we really covered a lot of ground um, just in the, what we set out to do, we went to a lot of the venues and we played a lot of the um, gigs and we did a lot of the amazing events that uh, commemorated uh, the African-American string bands. And, and also for me, the goal was to always create a space for African-American roots music that um, uh, there's a, an academic term called non-blues secular black music. And it's a mm. mouthful of a term, but it really is the root of the type of music that um, I've presented for many years. Because if you think of African-American music as being a broad spectrum in the blues or string band or country music as being just a single genre within a broad spectrum of music, all of a sudden you're, you're starting to understand African-American culture in a whole new way. And, it, and it's a, a lot of the information and documentation that has been taken down by so many of the, the folklorists over the many years and from the many different institutions, they still can educate us in a lot of the cultural movements of the past leading into the present and the future. And that's why I ended up uh, starting to use the moniker, the American songster, because the American songster is built off of this idea of um, the songster in the late uh, 19th uh, century uh, was a little book of music or uh, lyrics, no music, but lyrics to a bunch of songs, popular songs. And it was assumed that you knew all of the melodies. So it was just the words written out almost like a secular hymnal. And in the 20th century, especially uh, in the African-American community, songsters became musicians that would travel around and they knew a variety of material for each community. And so that led to a lot of very interesting uh, musicians who had a variety of material and that led into the early recorded era. And so I referenced back to that era, but I've refashioned it to fit into the 21st century where in a similar way in the digital revolution, we are seeing a similar change like the industrial revolution where people are taking in uh, user generator, generated data and turning it into the statements that we talk and use about culture. And so um, I, I've, I've used my platform as a musician to uh, tell a little bit about the songs I do, but as well as um, uh, sp- spread a little bit of the knowledge about the scholarship that's out there. 
um, many of it um, uh, still essential to many young minds that want to expand deeper into the story. Do you feel like you're a mentor in the music world? Does that, because you come from this such a rich academic background, does that, is that kind of like in your, your genes to be able to be a mentor to up and coming people in your area? Well, I, I'd hope so in, in one way. The other way is that I, um, when, when I first started to uh, play as a professional, 2005 is when I started to think of myself as a professional musician. Before then, I was learning songs, writing songs, and, and doing anything. But uh, when I saw that I could start performing songs and create a cultural relevance for these songs that uh, could help as, uh, as we made our way into the 21st century, I, I thought that that was a righteous deed in and of itself. And I, and I thought about a lot of people that had influenced me along the way, particularly uh, Mike Seeger, who is someone that I met the Black Banjo Gathering. And he was an advocate for traditional styles and instruments. And so not just songs, but uh, knowing that there are certain traditional instruments that go with certain traditional styles and knowing that presenting both of those uh, elements together can create its own uh, sort of, uh, you know, the audience appreciates the music in a whole different way. You know, if, uh, if uh, you have a banjo from the region and the time frame from when the song was written or recorded, then it might sound uh, like a three-dimensional presentation of the field recording. And so Mike was really delved into a lot of that. And so he and I spent many years talking about it. I would visit him in his house in Lexington, Virginia, and and talk and uh, we would listen to records and swap ideas. But when it comes to listening to records and appreciating music just by hearing it, that's what it's all been about for me. I, I've always been a fan of music and I, I've always uh, collected a lot of music. And as I found, um, you know, uh, I don't know, in the course of conversation, uh, I see that people are interested in certain types of music and I, I like to try to, uh, I don't know, uh, spread, the, spread the wealth around. There are so many recordings that are out there. Oh, totally. Do you feel like you're very self-taught? Do you read music as well? And I, I don't read music. No, um, don't. no. I, I have. Uh, I can. I can read basic uh, chord chart theory, but that I can't read melodies or notes. I, I tried to, and I and I can. I can do it on a basic level because I did it in grade school, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't do a symphony or anything like that. No, it's all folk music. I, I'm not a a. a a classically trained musician that changed over into folk music or um, a, a uh, rock and roll or a, uh, a, a punk rock musician who changed to folk music. I always started out in the folk revival and the singer songwriters of the early seventies. That was really my first, um, uh, that was how I really cut my teeth. And I performed solo in the coffee houses and in uh, performing arts centers out in Arizona, folk festivals, Prescott, Flagstaff, uh, Tucson. I just did the local thing for many, many years, you know, and I got a chance to experiment with a lot of different types of styles and, and found something that fit for me. Nice. And, and all the different instruments that you got into, how hard or easy it was it to convert yourself to like, okay, I'm going guitar, banjo. Uh, how, how hard or easy is that for you to, to do that? Well, as a percussionist, you're always faced with multiple instruments in your repertoire, no matter what. So I, I've always, from the very beginning, I've had a sense of multiple instruments uh, when it came, came to performing, you know, and, and, and also when you're playing percussion, you can switch from one instrument to the other uh, based on the arrangement or the composition. And so putting an instrument down and picking up a new instrument or playing one instrument at one time and then playing another instrument with another rhythm is something that's very natural to me. And again, with it being my only formal training, uh, polyrhythms come to me very easily. And so uh, when I started to play the guitar, I found that the guitar also had polyrhythms. You could play chords and you could play notes and melodies, but there were also polyrhythms and rhythmic sounds, which is of course what drew me to people like Charlie Patton and Lead Belly because their guitar playing is so rhythmic it's, um, I mean, I still think that when I hear like a song like Gallus Pole by Lead Belly, it has a sound like he's playing a turntable, like when he hits the brakes, because it has a rhythm like, you know, and if you listen to the break on it, it's a, this, it's a, like a, a machine gun rhythm that I hear in trap music now to this day. And I've always, uh, listen for those sounds. And so that's something that's more casual. And then when situations have come up, I've always uh, 
had wonderful things to talk about. And, you know, uh, everybody from, I don't know, last year I got to meet Quincy Jones for the first time. And that wow, was a one. I saw him time. once, yeah. And that was, uh, you know, and we were talking about Sonny Terry. He was telling me about uh, the, the being on the set of Color Purple and talking about Sonny Terry because I had played a harmonica piece that night. And he started talking folk music with me, which was amazing. I never would have thought, one, to have met Quincy Jones, but then two, to have talked folk with music with him for uh, the better part of uh, 30, 40 minutes, you know? It was really just just beautiful, you know? And, and, and that, make, that makes it worth going into the office every day to just to have moments where um, I can, of course, present music that, that people are, might enjoy, you know? I hope they enjoy, you know? <laughs> um, but also, uh, I, it's also personally satisfying whenever I get a chance to personally connect with someone who's made an impression on me as a, as a person, you know, because music makes an impression on you. Oh, yeah. And somebody like Quincy Jones, what a living legend. He had a box set out years ago. It's like the, the amount of work that he it just It's phenomenal. It really is. And the range of artists that he has produced, it's, you, you, can't, it, you can't even keep up with it. Um, what's it like re now? How many albums did you do with the chocolate drops? And then how many, uh, are you, have you done solo? We did a, a total of, uh, five records, uh, with the, the chocolate drops. Um, there were two major label ones, genuine Negro jig, which won the Grammy and then leaving Eden, which got the nomination for the Grammy. But we did five with music maker relief foundation, one with Joe Thompson. Uh, there was one, uh, Dona got a rambling mind. And then there was a, an album called Colored Aristocracy, which was from an earlier version of the group called Sankofa Strings. And that featured uh, Rena and myself and a, a mentor of mine, Sule Greg Wilson. And, and then I did uh, two records of my own on Music Maker, a Dance Tunes, Ballads and Blues, as well as American Songster, in which I used that moniker for the first time. And then, of course, along the way, I, I have a bunch of friends that I've uh, played music with, including the East River String Band, and I play with the Crumb, the great uh, underground cartoonist, when, uh, whenever I've done a gig with them. And um, I've, I've gotten a chance to meet some wonderful people. Uh, you know, even uh, recently, they've talked about Odetta a bunch, uh, and, and, you know, I got to meet Odette on four different occasions. One time at the American Legacy office when uh, they had a wonderful music issue on black string bands. And that was wonderful. And uh, one time she got to, she signed my copy of Odetta Sings Ballads and Blues. Um, we, uh, the Chocolate Drops opened for her in 2007 at Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And then two times I just went to go see her backstage. I just, she was on the bill with me in Canada uh, at the festival. And I just went, you know, it, it was Odetta, you know what? why not go backstage because she already knew me and I just said hey Odetta how are you doing you doing all right and just seeing how she was doing and those are wonderful memories I have in my mind and you know and I have uh, dozens and dozens of memories of some of the some wonderful musicians that are um, some famous some not famous some are um, uh, more obscure or niche but um, just wonderful musicians we're all and we're all drawn by the same thing the passion of music and the spirit of music Oh yeah, R. Crumb. What, where, and how? What did you do with R. Crumb? I, I, that's somebody that really comes to mind because I got to uh, meet Harvey P. Carr. Oh yes, right. Did the writing for R. Crumb's uh, material and great movie about Harvey P. Carr done years ago, and then yeah. wonderful documentary on R. Crumb that I saw. Yeah, uh, Jerry wow. Yeah. So, wh what, what did you do with R. Crumb? Well, meeting R. Crumb was very interesting because I, I met him through some friends of mine, a group called the East River String Band, Eden and John's East River String Band. And I had met them through the Jalopy Theater, which is a venue in Red Hook, Brooklyn. And so John Hennigan is a 78 collector. And Eden got to know um, R. Crumb's daughter, Sophie, actually. And, you know, and Sophie's an artist as well. And, and uh, so in the course of them being friends, Sophie saw that John had these records and said, hey, you should meet my dad. And so John kind of was like, okay, I'd love to meet our crumb. Who wouldn't want to meet our crumb? And so they just really hit it off and they're just very great friends. And so they, they trade 78s and they go on trips together and the, the whole thing, they go shopping you know, for 78s and whatnot, you know, um, uh, just, uh, and it, it, and I've gone on a, a couple of trips with them as well. And it's just been really fun, you know, and, and 
uh, our crumb and I have the same birthday, so it's a uh, kind of a funny. Uh, it just we've just had some fun times, and then we've played gigs together. We've done about uh, half a dozen, ten gigs together overall, just very casually. Um, with the East River String Band, I've guested on about three of their records, and all of the records are done by R. Crumb, and so I have a, a rendering of R. Crumb that's that's on each of these records, and it's really just it's just fun, you know. That's one of the more casual things I've done and just to get to meet our crumb and and get to play music with him he's an, an excellent tenor banjo player and an excellent mandolinist and you know a lot of people don't know that or um they may not know his group the cheap suit serenaders i was a big 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 fan of that group um uh, for years and years so also it was great to be able to sit on the bandstand with him just just to do that you know oh that's so awesome what was it like uh how did you feel when you won the some grammys <laughs> that was a, mean, must feel uh, <laughs> yeah. the is, 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 that's a that's an interesting uh it was an interesting moment you know um you know a genuine negro jig was uh was our first major label gig of course the first thing i was relieved that we won the grammy the first time because of course i was very grateful because many years um you can be nominated for a grammy and of course i've been nominated since and uh, you you don't win the grammy sometimes it's uh, sometimes the competition is very stiff so uh, the fact that we were able to win so early on was was something that i've always been very grateful for but also working with joe henry uh, was was essential and working with none such records and david Byther, and uh, you know it was our first uh, first outing as a as a group outside of being a, a homegrown group that had, had come up through the ranks, of course, playing in the rural South and, and starting to build a, a um, audience from first from square dances up into the major venues. And so we did that slowly and steadily. So when we met with none such records, we, we decided to take it up a notch. And so we really put down all of the, sh the songs in our show that had been essential pieces, uh, cornbread and butter beans and, Genuine Negro Jig at Hit 'Em Up Style and Your Baby Ain't Sweet Like Mine and and then we put a couple of other ones on there. Uh, I had a version of Trampled Rose by Tom Waits from his album Real Gone, which um, I always love that record. And so we did that one. Um, Joe Henry, for example, uh, we were talking on the phone with him, uh, trying to see if it, it if it was going to be a good fit. And he and I got to talking about uh, the records he had worked on and. When he mentioned that he did Don't Give Up On Me uh, by Solomon Burke, I, I told everybody, I said, we have to work with Joe Henry. Uh, you know, it, after, because I remember in Phoenix, I heard, heard uh, Don't Give Up On Me, and I thought it was one of the most beautiful records ever made. And yeah. so I said, we got to work with Joe Henry. And so we did. And, you know, he told, uh, uh, Joe told some amazing stories about Solomon. And, and at that time, he was uh, getting ready to start working with Ramblin' Jack Elliott on uh, the I'm, I'm Stranger Here album. So it was a beautiful moment. So, you know, I, I always uh, I always have the, um, the, the philosophy myself when working with people, if you can conf compare philosophies together um, and, and, it, and it can work out, you can work together. And so when Joe and I started talking about uh, Ramblin' Jack and talking about some of the good old folk music, uh, I knew we could work together really well. And same thing with Buddy Miller. When Buddy Miller told me that he recorded Solomon Burke doing, uh, that's, uh, that's how I got to Memphis in his house. That's when I said, we got to do this. And that's why we cut Leaving Eden right there, right there in Buddy Miller's house. <laughs> well, Solomon Burke, not like this huge household name, but I, I talk to the musicians and it's like, that's like the Holy Grail in a way. It's like, it, it's amazing. The inspiration from uh, somebody like a Solomon Burke. Um, how, what's it like uh, recording? How's the recording process for you when you go into the, do you go into major studios? Do you do this, you know, on location? Uh, it's changed over the years. And, and then I did get to see Solomon Burke before he passed away when I was on tour. It was in Denmark. Oh, wow. Two in the morning, raining, but under a, a big tent. And uh, it was it was the most amazing show I'd ever seen. Just sitting in, I was sitting in the wings. So I was actually like five feet away from the man. So it was pretty amazing on that one. Anyway, but Solomon Burke, uh, he, was a, he, he was, an, he was a, a beautiful inspiration, but yeah. you know, the recording process at first, I started out just uh, as, as a straight uh, folkloric recorder. I, I liked putting the one microphone up and I was a big fan of people like Tom Waits. And so I liked the crunchy uh, lo-fi recording sound. I liked the sound of a demo recording because also I started to make records, uh, uh, well, I started to listen to records 
at a time when uh, some of the major albums were being re-released and um, a lot of those albums featured bonus tracks from artists that were demo recordings, small acoustic recordings that were just interesting, unfinished pieces. And I always liked that quality. And I also liked that quality in early 70s acoustic recordings where you have this very acoustic-y folk sound, but you have a big, broad sound like a jazz record in its own type of way, you know? And so I've yeah. always tried to get a little bit of that give and take when I've really gotten into the studio, especially when I got into the major label stuff. I really wanted to figure out how can I create a nice broad spectrum that's cinematic and is a, is a nice, uh, a beautiful record that, uh, that can be just as in, engaging as, as a rock and roll or as a, any pop record, but it's, it's rooted in folk tradition. And it also explains and shows the way to the, to the source material in its own type of way. And I try to be meticulous in creating liner notes and uh, certain sounds so that you might be drawn back. You know, I don't try to copy it, of course. You know, I've never copied a sound in my entire career, except if I cover a song and I always make sure to reference back. But if I do an original number, I try to figure out a way to uh, reference back, but um, make, sure it's, um, make sure it's something new and unique. Yeah, it must be a really tough process to say, hey, I, I love the sound I just created or this melody, but has this been done before? I mean, how do you check against that? That's got to be like really tough. I wish there was like some computer program that says, here, here's my melody. Can I check against this? You know, somebody going to accuse me of ripping something off? Well, you know, it's a funny thing because, you know, back uh, when I started when I was 16, I, I got a, a small Tascam uh, Tascam studio uh, cassette uh, four track recorder. And so I learned how to overdub. I learned how to mix. Mm -hmm. I learned how to do basic mastering on a very small scale on my own. And so when I went into the studio, even though I couldn't use any of the bigger machines, I had a basic idea of what I was looking for every time I was going into the studio. And I really tried to craft all of those records in one way or another. And there was a lot of pre-production in all of those records. Uh, it, with every Chocolate Drops record, I took 40 different songs that we had arranged and played in concert. And I got reactions from the audiences. And then I made demo recordings of the group. And then I crafted it down into 20 songs and I sent that off to the label. We crafted that down into 15 songs and then we made it into the final product as we saw. And I do that with every record. Um, with Prospect Hill, which was sort of a step in a different direction, of course, breaking away from the chocolate drops. Because of course, that was uh, when we were working with the major label. With Prospect Hill, that was my first independent project where I got to do it all on my own and I produced the entire project. So what I wanted to do was I wasn't sure if people wanted a more traditional sounding record or if they wanted a more progressive sounding record. 2014 was sort of a it was sort of a year that it was really hard to tell. It could go either way. People really wanted a rooted sound and people also wanted a futuristic sound. So I was trying to figure out where do I fit in that as a historian, as well as a, as a modern artist. And so I had songs that I had written, of course, in different genre styles. And I always like to think of my songs as lost records because it kind of allows me to kind of get away from myself as a songwriter. I get to write them and then I get to perform them as, I get to think of them, you know, my, I think of it as character acting almost in a way, you know, I have to write a song and then I have to learn how to tell that song, you know, and perform that song, you know, and so Prospect Hill, I wanted to have um, two different bands. I wanted to have a folk band that would be very traditional sounding and I wanted a band that would be more like a jazz band or a bebop jazz band more so, because of course, for me, I've always been a fan of Charles Mingus, another Arizona native, uh, and I've always been a big fan of Art Blakey and uh, any number of uh, Blue Note records, and I wanted to try to figure out a way to make a folk or an old-time record that had the aesthetic qualities of any of those Blue Note records, because, of course, uh, bebop jazz is acoustic music as well. Most of the times, you are not using electric instruments, and so you really have just great engineering, great mic placement to capture those sounds. And so that's why I hired Jason Richmond to be the engineer. And so he and I went on the journey. Um, we had a six day sessions, uh, uh, two different sessions, a combination of seven days all together. One session featured Guy Davis, a wonderful mentor of mine and a great friend, um, uh, Ben Hunter, uh, another uh, uh, fellow who uh, grew up in Arizona 
and uh, I actually knew him uh, way back and and he plays the fiddle and uh, he, he and his uh, singing partner uh, Joe Siemens uh, they were uh, playing together at a teaching week I was um, performing at in Port Townsend Washington and I wanted to feature them on the recordings because I thought they had a really great sound and so I had one band that featured them and of course I had a uh, Purfe Cressoni, uh, doing some backup vocals a little bit later on the first band. And then the second band featured a, a small group that uh, Jason Richmond recommended, because I asked him if he had anybody that he would recommend in the, in the local area of North Carolina. And he found just a great group of musicians, Ron Brendel, who had uh, played with Mose Allison, uh, Kobe Watkins on the drums, who had played with Sonny Rollins for many years. Also, we had uh, Keith Gans, who's played with everybody from... Uh, uh, Bruce Coburn, to, you know, he's he's a, a an all around session guy, and uh, Brian Horton, who was a uh, actually a, he's a, a protege to a Branford Marcellus, and so I brought these wonderful musicians together, and and so when I did the sessions, we cut everything for that one. I wanted it to all be laid out. I wanted alternates of all the songs, and I wanted a, a big palette to work with because I eventually wanted to make a box set, which is what I didn't this year in 2020 with the American songster Omnibus. And I did songs like Till the Seas Run Dry. And the first session was with Guy Davis and Ben Hunter. And we cut a great version of it. Um, and then we cut another great version with the jazz band. And then I had to choose between these two great versions. And when I did Prospect Hill first in 2014, I chose the jazz band version because it was just a beautiful recording. But I couldn't let the Guy Davis version uh, sit in the vaults and so in 2015 I tried to follow the trend of record store day again advocating for vinyl records and and the power of local music in a in a record store and I, I made a record store day EP featuring um, not only alternates of songs that were on Prospect Hill but I also featured beats and again reaching into my percussion roots I wanted to feature these sort of fife and drum rhythms that featured different ambient sounds because of course ambient sounds is something that's a part of the the landscape of music now and i just wanted to also reach into that and show the way that traditional music also has these beautiful ambient sounds africanisms and caribbeanisms as well as americanisms and uh, every other type of worldism that you can find within the american landscape and so that's something I'm always trying to present in my shows. And of course, in the studio, you can go much farther with it because of course I can play multiple instruments or I can get others to play parts. Um, but that was what I do with Prospect too. And then I followed it up with Black Cowboys, which again was much more focused in its theme, but it was still, I, I took the same method of finding a broad palette. <laughs> so why in 2020? This is, a, this is an amazing box set. I just listened to this. Um, uh, not an exact you know, uh, milestone anniversary of Prospect Hill, but this box set comes out this year. Was it just time you were just itching to get the stuff out of the vault? Well, when I originally came out with it, it was on the Music Maker Relief Foundation label, which is a nonprofit label that I've worked with for many years. And Timothy Duffy and, and Denise Duffy um, have put out all three of my records. And again, the, the early Chocolate Drops records were also put out on Music Maker. But over time, uh, Tim's actually been focusing a lot more on photography. And, and in 2014, he started making these beautiful tintype photos, which are a part of the entire package for the Prospect Hill uh, uh, box set and it's um, w once he went into doing that and I moved down to North Carolina in 2014 I it was just a wonderful time to get our partnership to um, uh, take on a whole other level and so we, uh, first we just were experimenting with the with the camera and it was really interesting at first I tried to um, I tried to just replicate old photos I had seen in books then I had ones where I had my instruments laid out. And then we did ones close up, far away. And this was over a two and a half year period. And also this was between all of the wonderful sessions that Tim did with all the great music maker artists. So I was there for all of those sessions because Tim would call me up and say, hey, Captain Luke's coming down. Boo Hanks is here. And I'd watch all day long as they shot these beautiful tintypes and watch the entire process of wet play collodion and got to... Um, uh, build a new part of history in a way because remember we always think of tin types as being old technology but it was right. cutting edge when it was made and it's just as cutting edge when you try to put a modern spin on it and so we 
tried to do that with Prospect Hill in every type of way. And so that's something I've always done, even in the chocolate drops. Um, it links back to uh, my work with Bill Steber um, with the Leaving Eden cover, as well as many of the chocolate drop stuff. We had tin types way back then. And it was just amazing to be able to go deeper into the country blues uh, iconography world. You know, we, we obsess over the one and two pictures of a blues artist. But what would happen if that blues artist had access to the camera and had more photos taken? And, and, and that was something that I, I tried to use, um, you know, having access to the, the camera and then also uh, Tim having a wonderful eye and a great sense of how he wanted to frame photos and how he wanted to do stuff. I mean, it's also Tim's eye as well as um, uh, uh, the folks over there, Aaron Greenhood and uh, Cornelius Lewis and, and of course, Tim's wife, Denise Duffy. They've all worked as this wonderful team. And so it was just wonderful. We had many years where we just got to work together and, and Prospect Hill came from those times, you know, um, yeah, like I said, it was a it was a moment where I wasn't sure uh, how progressive or how regressive I needed to be, and so I wanted to be both on both records. And so, over time, again, they started focusing on the photography, and so the the album had gotten gone out of print. I bought the stock out from from them, and I just didn't know what I was going to do with the album. And I just figured, let me just reissue the album. And I, I put it out in segments, but I figured, let me put it all together in one package. And um, Cheryl over at Omnivore was just so kind and just picked up the album instantly and said, yes, I'd love to reissue it. And then she asked me, is there anything you haven't reissued or you haven't released? And uh, as I've mentioned before, there was a lot of material that was left on the, the cutting room floor, except for this one segment of audio that I had put together that I wasn't able to use. It was sort of an offshoot of what got over. It was all these instrumental and ambient tracks. And so I asked Jason Richmond to send me everything that he thought might be usable from the ambient tracks that we did put together. And he sent me 12 tracks. And so I was, I thought, wow, not only uh, did I get a few tracks, but I got 12 tracks, including great instrumental cuts for like Hot Chicken, the big band. Um, I did the vocals afterward and a Clock on the Wall as well. Those were songs that we really wanted to emphasize the big band because it was the first time I had had a full group. Every one of my recordings before that was always solo or maybe one overdub that I would play Jug or maybe some Bones or something. But um, we, we really wanted to go the full scale with it. And it was really wonderful to even hear a song like Clock on the Wall without the words. It really um, made a very intriguing story. So um, once I got all the tracks, I sequenced it into a third part and, and voila, we have a box set. It's a beautiful box set. We could find this just about any record store, special order it. That's cool. Um, it's, uh, and, and there are extensive liner notes that your wife was involved with. That's correct. My, my wife, Anita Kennard, since um, working on the Black Cowboys liner notes, um, has worked with me editing all of my, my written materials and also my social media. She's my, she's my uh, second in command, is right there with me and making sure that everything we put out there is completely on the level. And um, so when uh, we were thinking about reissuing the album, I was thinking just doing like a years ago, Simon and Garfunkel did a, a, a box set of all of their Columbia albums. And I thought maybe doing a mini LP sleeve package. And she looked at me and said, you just need to do the whole package over again and rewrite the liner notes. And I agreed with her. I thought that in five years, I had gotten a lot more perspective on every single one of the songs and arrangements and I've traveled all over the world with these arrangements and songs and and all of this material and so to come back it was wonderful to revisit one because it was a special session you know um, it was the year of the folk singer and uh, I don't tell people a lot about it because uh, it's a kind of a big idea but right before we started the sessions Guy Davis came down from the hospital. He had visited Pete Seeger and Pete Seeger had passed away as Guy Davis had left the hospital coming down to the session. And also Ruby D, Guy Davis's mom was also in the hospital too. So we were all sort of had heavy hearts about these wonderful people being, you know, in these final hours and then the twilight hours. And so the sessions had a special uh, love of the music because Pete, even to the end, Guy was said he was still tapping his toe and wanting to sing a song with him, even even uh, as he left. And so uh, Guy brought that 
spirit with him to the recording session. And that's why we did a song like Marching Up Prospect Hill, which is a tribute to Sonny Terry and uh, J.C. Burris, who um, you can find a wonderful video that Pete Seeger shot of uh, Sonny Terry and J.C. Burris um, in North Carolina, actually. And it has them dancing and doing bones and harmonica. And so I wanted to evoke that sound with Guy Davis because Guy is one of the few harmonica players who does that wonderful Sonny Terry style. And again, wanted to get a beautiful ambiance of the sort of a revelry of, uh, of uh, uh, some of that old time music. And then old time hip hop as well, which is another style of music. That's why we got the grotto beat going on. Um, Guy, of course, is uh, one, of the, one of the pioneers of hip hop. Uh, his yeah. first acting gig was in the movie Beat Street uh, under the uh, production of Harry Belafonte, no less. Um, uh, and so it was fun to be able to get Guy to do that monologue. And, and then, of course, we got to do the instrumental version on the box set as well. But, of course, there, all of these songs kind of go a, a multiple paths. And I, I was so glad to be able to finally bring them all into one place. Uh, it's, kind of a big, it's kind of a big album. I know I, it seemed like kind of exhaustive. When you look at the package, you're like, 35 tracks? It seems like a lot. But, again, when I started to see how these small segments of of beats and sounds fit together it was really fun to make an extra little pathway because um of course a lot of my music can be a little bit up tempo and uh and uh it, it was nice to be able to have a a very uh lovely third chapter that that takes you into this sort of mellower place and that was something that was very uh, surprising to me uh, even having recorded the album myself to um to find this beautiful little mellow space that these uh, these instrumental tracks and of course the uh, the grand manifesto uh, with big head joe and the electric guitar that was another uh, that was a track i had worked on and i i i, I wasn't able to find the final element uh, when i was recording it but in revisiting it uh, we found we we found it you know and it was beautiful just to be able to, to get the sound of the giant uh, six string banjo next to this beautiful electric guitar Ah, just a, a wonderful juxtaposition. And then, then Blue Butterfly, which was another little instrumental. It was just one take that Guy Davis and I did in the studio, literally one take. And I listened back to that thing and I thought it was so beautiful and it made a wonderful ender because um, uh, Prospect Hill thematically talks about a lot of different themes of, of uh, betrayal and love and jest and... Uh, uh, going back and forth through time and space and places, you know, and, and to end on Blue Butterfly and it felt like such a wonderful um, a cleansing moment for the, the entire uh, project. And I was I'm just so glad that it, it, it tied itself up in that way. And, you know, you just never know sometimes. You, you paint a picture and you just never know what the last element is going to be. And a Blue Butterfly, who knew? You know? Yeah, yeah. It's really, uh, you know, it really moves. You say 35 tracks, like, oh my gosh, this is so, it really moves. It doesn't feel like, you know, however much time has passed because it's just, I mean, songs aren't very long either. So, it, and it's a great flow. So it's like, it, it goes really fast when you really think about it. You go yeah. through all the discs. Georgia yeah. Drumbeat is one of my. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, well, that was, that was, a see, and it's funny, that was very, that was on purpose. At the time, a lot of the records I felt were, were excessive with extra space on the tracks. Like people were doing a lot of long notes and long fades and everything at that time. And I wanted everything to be concise. I wanted it to be like rock and rolls, 1950s, like two and a half minutes or a 210. Like, um, like I can't do it anymore. It's like 212. And I wanted it to be like a Roger Miller length record like it i didn't want it to be a three or five minute song and that was on purpose and so prospect hill is 38 minutes 20 minutes for what got over and then one more 22 minutes to make um an, an even uh, 90 minute record out of um out of all those tracks and i've always sequenced my records that way i think of them as I don't like to sequence beforehand when I'm making my material. I like to get all of the material in one place and find the story within it because a lot of the, uh, it's easy to, to get lost in the, it's easy to get lost. It's, there's a lot of the stories that are being told and it's easy to get lost. And so for me, I sequencing, uh, 
in the digital age, I can't guarantee that someone's going to just listen to the whole record. So you've got to sequence it so it's good from the beginning to the end. And I'm an old school record collector in that way. Uh, some people aren't sticklers about it. It is a little obsessive when it comes to the sequencing process. But yeah. uh, at the end of the day, it, you know, I can do everything I can until I release this record. And if something's wrong, just like any record, it's wrong forever. And uh-huh. as an artist, I got to do what I can to try to at least, you know, do the best I can, I, you know, and, and, and for me, it's, I also try to make sure the song sounds spontaneous. I, I, I always hate it when a song is, has, has uh, lived its life and you don't record it in time and uh, then it's gone, you know, and I also, I try to figure out ways to make the song sound fresh every time. Um, even though the songs, many of the songs were written five and six and sometimes 10 and 12 years before Prospect Hill even came out. So the Caesar on Dry, I wrote that back in 2008. Um, but when I recorded it, I made it so that it sounded spontaneous, like it's the very first time I ever sang it. Um, you know, and that's something that you do in the studio. And that's something I've always, I don't know, I think about people like Harry Belafonte, for example. His records are, uh, he, he sounds so alive when he's singing in, on his records. And so I try to I tried to evoke these type of sounds, you know, when I, you know, or, or I think of Cat Stevens as well. He's another great guy. Great acoustic records. If people haven't ever heard his whole catalog, it's beautiful acoustic guitars with rock drums and, you know, yeah. so, I didn't get into rock drums necessarily, but I got into some very funky uh, R&B rhythms though. And some honky tonk though, which was fun. <laughs> I saw Cat Stevens. I think Stephen Colbert had him on not too long ago. Yeah. Um, sounded amazing i guess you know, just preserved his voice i guess he wasn't touring and you know performing live too much it sounded just absolutely incredible so are you of somebody of many disciplines you have many instruments you you learn you, you do the fife as well That's right mm-hmm. and it just uh do you, have you done any acting or anything outside of uh music I have. I've, I have done a little bit of acting. My first role in, an, in, in a movie was in The Great Debaters uh, with Denzel Washington and uh, Forrest Whitaker. I was oh, wow. starring, um, I, well, it's, I was in the Juke Joint Band in the very first scene. So if you turn on The Great Debaters, you can find me in the first five minutes of the movie. You can catch my head ducking down as I'm playing some drums in the Juke Joint Band. It's really, it was really a fun time. Sharon Jones was there. Uh, Alvin Youngblood Hart, and that was our collective group. Of course, Sharon Jones has passed. I that was I got to meet her, and I got to. It was right when um, it was right when Amy Winehouse had just gotten big, and so it was great to meet Sharon at a time before Sharon had gotten big. It was right before she herself had gotten big, so I got to just spend a lot of time with her on the set and just chatting about stuff. Anyway, it was really fun. And uh, Alvin Youngblood Hart, of course, is a, is a, is a, another mentor of mine, a great hero to me. And so we all worked together on the great debaters for that. And we did the soundtrack, which you can still find on Atlantic Records. So that was the first thing I did. Um, I've done a couple of independent movies here and there. You can find them. They're kind of like, um, there's one called Sprout Wings and Fly, which was done in uh, Asheville and in Western North Carolina. But more recently, I was on uh, I was on Sun Records on CMT uh, on uh, in 2015. I played the role of Joe Hill Lewis, and uh, that kind of came in as a, an interesting sort of um, project out of the blue. I was just um, actually I wasn't actually doing anything. I was going to the grocery store actually, <laughs> and I get a text from my good friend Pokey Lafarge, who um, I've known Pokey Lafarge since 2006 and we've been good friends forever. And he asked me if I knew any songs by this fellow, Joe Hill Lewis. Now Joe Hill Lewis is an obscure blues singer who was a one man band. So he played the bass drum and the guitar and the harmonica and the hi-hat at the same time. And he played on WDIA, the all black radio station in Memphis, Tennessee with Rufus Thomas, you know, the, the funky chicken and all that. And so, he was a harmonica guy that was one of the influential guys that was in the sort of Sonny Boy Williamson, the second vein, like he was a radio harmonica guy. And so he had this song, Gotta Let You Go. And it's the very first recording that Sam Phillips did in Sun, what would become Sun Records. So it is the first recording that Sam Phillips and Dewey Phillips, the DJ, would record together and try to sell on the market. 
And so I played Joe Hill Lewis and I played the, I was on Beale Street and I played the one man band and, and then got in the studio and, and did Gotta Let You Go, which is, um, it's, it's a hip hop, it's old time hip hop song. It's about, it's a, it's a song about a fellow who gets married and the woman's just not treating him right. And so he's, he's got to tell her, he's got to tell her what's up. And, uh, it's a, a very, uh, it's a funny song though. It's, it, it's also a, a funny song too. It's kind of a novelty type of number. So it's, um, it was great to be able to play that in the show. And yeah, I, I had that going on and uh, yeah, just, uh, it, it just had a few roles here and there. You know, those, those are my two main ones though. Uh, great debaters and, uh, and uh, Sun Records. I don't mind, I don't mind being typecast as an old time musician. That's like, you can anytime, anytime, you know? <laughs> It's needed when, you know, it, it's funny you do these period pieces or anything like that. You need like a juke joint band or anything like that. I think that's just obviously it would be very natural to have somebody like yourself in it. Are you one of the very few, did I read this somewhere? You're one of the very few who's qualified to speak about Lil Nas X. <laughs> <laughs> one of the few people qualified. Oh. I don't know. Yeah, how do you be qualified to talk about <laughs> Lil Nas X? Well, what's interesting about Lil Nas X, okay, so I'll, I'll frame it this way to start before mentioning it. So I did the album Black Cowboys completely independent of Old Town Road and the phenomenon of Lil Nas X. But I made, at first I was going to make Black Cowboys an all originals album, and I was going to just write my own songs about the stories I had read and the forensics I had found. But I found uh, just very quickly that it would serve better as a comprehensive overview of the history of Black Cowboys instead of it being necessarily an all originals record that I would do. And so that was what got me thinking about uh, uh, approaching Smithsonian Folkways and, and trying to make the album a part of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Because I had, I had known the, the, uh, the curators of the museum for many years. Um, I played at the, uh, the Museum of the American Indian and I got to meet Dwandal and Reese and then we got to talking about uh, the museum opening up eventually at that point. Um, but I knew the series was there and I loved a lot of the records from the series. And I thought that Black Cowboys would be a perfect addition to the series, but there had not been many contemporary artists on the, that series at the time. And so I spoke with Dan Shahey and, and uh, we uh, got to talking with Lonnie Bunch Jr. And, and he thought that, um, and they thought it was a great idea to have Black Cowboys on the series. And so uh, it, it then changed focus completely into more of a comprehensive overview. And so the reason I did that is being from Arizona, the story of African-Americans out in the Southwest is a, is a different story than the uh, standard African-American history you might hear when it comes to civil rights history. And, that, and a, a reason for that is that a lot of the uh, major uh, developments in Western culture happened in the 1880s and in the 1870s leading into the 20th century. And of course, with the implement, implementation of strict segregation in 1900, you see the entire landscape of America change. And so uh, before that, you see um, African-American uh, culture, settlement, movement. It, it has a whole different uh, tone and flavor, and it takes a lot to explain that to people. Uh, because I'm not a rancher by birth, but my when I started to read about these wonderful uh, African-American pioneers, I started to see the stories of my father's uh, parents, uh, my grandparents, and how they had moved out from East Texas and Arkansas. And I saw that westward migration as being uh, a, a wave coming from the post-World War II era. But I found that there were, uh, I found that it was, um, it was, it, it was a, um, <clears throat> I found that it was connected by this sort of like this notion to move out west for a better life, to move the peg forward, as my father would say it. And I found that my grandparents followed that same path that the Exodusters followed or any of the other west, westward pioneers. They, they made their way into a, a new landscape to find a new life. And I, and I related to that story because it's a story that I've known all my life being a westerner. And so it was, a, it's been, I had to spend a long time researching, figuring out how could I, how, how did the history fit uh, in the contemporary landscape compared to the landscape of the past? And yeah. so it took quite a while to do that. So once I released the album, it got a Grammy nomination. And literally, as I, I think I, I then went to the Grammys 
Um, I just got the nomination. I didn't win that year, you know, which is what happens sometimes. Stiff competition that year. It was a, it was a, it was a big year. That was a big year. Joan Baez was on the bill. And, oh, and, the, yeah. and the Punch Brothers, Mary Gaucher. It was a, it was a big, big, uh, big list that year for folk. But I guess a month after uh, the Grammys, I um, actually had uh, gotten an interview with Rolling Stone magazine. And at that time, actually, no, it went the other way around. So first I was approached by Al Jazeera Plus. I, I was approached uh, by them to talk about this little Nas X song. And Billy Ray Cyrus had not, uh, he had not been a part of the track at that point. It, it had only sort of exploded on TikTok and, and, and it started to make its, its rounds on the billboard. So I was, I was on tour at that time. So I just heard the song in passing and I didn't think much about it. I thought cowboy, cowboy hip hop, it seems like the next best thing. And that's what I, I had hoped because the last word in the Black Cowboys liner notes is hip hop because um, the old Chisholm Trail uh, with from Clear Rock Platt to me, I wanted to imply the idea of hip hop because when I heard the the field recording of the old Chisholm Trail, Clear Rock Platt singing is so gruff. It reminded me of trap music. It reminded me of Kendrick. It reminded me of this sort of newer hip hop that had been coming out. And I thought that just hearing it, it made me understand why Black Cowboys as a sound was relevant because it it told me a history that. Uh, may not be um, clear to people, or it may not be explicitly in front of them. But, you know, it's it's present, and it's there. And it's, it's not something that is uh, something that we just made up this year, but it's something that's actually been prevalent from the beginning. But it's, it's more of a shifting of the lens. So when Little Nas X comes out, first the song makes its rounds. And I, of course, I think it's interesting because of it, with the type of work I do, you have... A, the folk voice of this young man from the South. Uh, he has a uh, the sound of a banjo uh, under him. And then he's got a cowboy hat on with the hip hop. <laughs> and all of those elements coming together, knowing already what I knew about black cowboys and how big that idea alone is, it, it, it was something that people just, uh, and it was two minutes. It's also was two minutes. He took a rock and roll method. It's, it's rock around the clock in its own type of way. It's, uh, it hits you, you love it, you hear it, and it's gone. And, and that was something that made it just essential. I, I think that that's what made it such a popular song. So then there was the controversy, which led to its own uh, conversation. But, um, you know, I, I, at first, um, I think it's the next thing after Darius. I think it's, you know, it's the next in the timeline. That's how I always thought about it. And then I did my interview with Rolling Stone. And in the time between the first interview and the second interview, that's when Billy Ray came in. So then the interview was about country music duets, which is a different history because you have a country music duet history that goes back to Louis Armstrong and Jimmy Rogers all the way into, you know, we have any number of country hip hop, blues, soul duets that have happened since the 90s into the 2000s. Again, it's, it's, it's all about shifting the lens and the focus. It's if we don't think about these things as being black country or black old time, we would never think of them as such. But if we think of Dolly Parton writing a song called I Will Always Love You, when yeah. Whitney Houston does it, it's black country, but it's, a, it's, not, it's not a black country song because it's a African-American stylist from a different genre doing a country song. And so yeah. now... When you're talking about black country, you are now breaking into three different categories. See, with black cowboys, you got two things you're talking about. You're talking about you're talking about black cowboys as ranchers, and and then you're talking about black cowboys as a cultural phenomenon, which is which is two different things because that's real people in the South or rural people, and then you have if you put a cowboy hat on they're singing cowboys and there's a, a hollywood version and then there's also just people love cowboys it's a part of the american landscape it's uh it, you know it's apple pie baseball and cowboys that's that is one of the essential elements and so to put african-american into the landscape now you've got mexican vaqueros you've got native american cowboys you have a, a, a asian uh cowboys and, and railroad workers in any spectrum and even the idea of whiteness breaks away you have european settlers of every different sort that ranched and again it goes forever but when you go into black country you have 
folk music that fueled country, influenced country. You have country songs being done by African-American stylists. And sometimes you can have, like, I love the, the Nightlife by B.B. King, you know, Willie oh, yeah. Nelson's song. Super country when Willie Nelson does it, but when B.B. does it, it's a to totally different song. Yeah. African-American stylists reinventing the song. And then you have the third part, which is like Charlie Pride and Darius, who are African-American country and Western artists who run parallel with any other mainstream artist and you know they they're do, they're doing country music too and so there's three elements uh, when it comes to black country so with little Nas X's little two minute song he evoked both ideas so it really was a multifaceted reaction that came from the audience and uh, I think like the Beatles or anything else it's um we're in a time where people just got up and started screaming you know like they just started getting up and screaming because they loved the song and uh, you know, the, I tried to do that with Shake Your Money Maker with Rev Payton earlier this year, too. And we did a great little record with the Steve Cropper. And it was based on the same idea, just a, a hot little record to get you up and moving. And then just and that, oh, yeah. that's it, you know. And But Little Nas X, I mean, he it, he's also part of a brand new wave of artists who are completely uh, developing through the digital platform. And that's something that is not what I started out, I'm, I come from a performance artist background where I started out on street corners doing, uh, doing uh, uh, cartwheels and, and guitar tricks and, and flipping my guitar around and over my head like Charlie Patton. And so when I go into the digital stream, it's a, it's a different, it's a different thing, you know, but I'm also a scholar. So I'm also trying to show context and, and also get some of these, some of these artists, some well-known, some lesser known, and get them uh, recognized within the spectrum of, um, especially within country music, like groups like the Mississippi Sheiks, who are well known in the blues world. They're country music too, but they were never marketed as such. Well, not, actually, that's not true. They were marketed as, as both country music when they did the string band material, and then they were marketed as blues when they did the blues material. But now in the 21st century, we have an opportunity to be able to see the Mississippi Sheiks as a multifaceted music music and a multifaceted group just like we would think blues and country we can think of those things as being um, uh, flowing within a parallel stream instead of them being completely separate as we've seen them uh, beforehand excellent well it has been a pleasure uh speaking with you, with you this evening and i wish you all the best uh hopefully you'll be on the road soon and uh see you here in atlanta and yeah. uh I wish you all the best and uh, just keep on creating and performing. And um, I look forward to what, what's more to come. Absolutely. You know, in Atlanta, I, I've, for many years, I got to play over at uh, Little Five Points over there. I've, I've, I miss making it over to the Variety Playhouse every year. I used to do every December, used to play a, a concert out there. You know, I, I was thinking about Criminal Records recently. Um, on Smithsonian Folkways, they they reissued um, another Music Maker album uh, from Layla McCalla, uh, an album called Very Colored Songs. And, um, you know, at Criminal Records, it, I think it was back in 2000 and what was that, 2011. It was the yep, first time amazing. that Layla played with us. Uh, I went into Criminal and I found a copy of the wonderful box set, Alan Lomax in Haiti. And uh -huh. Layla had told me she was deep into the Haitian music and wanted to know more. And so I just went and I picked up a copy of that box set and then I put it right in her hands and said, Layla, tell me everything you can about this one whenever you get, get a chance. And, and it, it was wonderful to see uh, Very Colored Songs uh, find a new life because um, she did a couple of songs and she mentioned she got them from the box set. And that's a beautiful thing, you know, and, and it, it's wonderful to see the spirit of music continue to move on. Well, I appreciate your time. And uh, hope to see you in the future. Hope maybe I can make that at his attic show in oh, March. Oh, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, take care. Have a good evening.